Good morning. Good morning to all of you. It is just lovely to uh, see you today uh, on uh, what feels like a legitimate fall uh, Sunday. Thank you all for being here. If you're a first-time guest, you are more than welcome. Thank you. For those of you that are watching online, those who are watching next door in our overflow, welcome to all of you. We are continuing in uh, what's now been months long, a months long journey through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as we examine the commands of the King Jesus, commands to his people that we are obliged to obey. And by obeying them, uh, we are going to be better followers and more useful to him. Um, today's command is pretty straightforward. It's called, do the will of my Father. There's the command. Jesus said, do the will of my Father. Now, we're going to look at that command in its scriptural context. We're also today going to hear some of the apostles writing about keeping the commands of the Heavenly Father. And uh, it really today centers in on this, who goes to heaven and who doesn't. And it might surprise you what the Bible really says about that. I would love to invite you, it's not too late to sign up, on Thursday mornings in the Fellowship Hall next door from 9 o'clock to around 10, 15. If you're free, retired, shift worker, would love for you to come. We're going through uh, eight, nine classes about heaven. We're talking about what heaven is, what it looks like, um, when those doors open, all, all that really interesting and intriguing stuff. I'd love to have you. And I want to open today with a joke that worked well last Thursday. <laughs> and when I find a joke that works, I want to, I want to share it. I, a guy dies and goes to heaven, shows up kind of surprised and works his way through the fog and the, the mist until he comes to St. Peter at a, a big bench and he's got a big book in front of him and Peter motions him forward. What's your name? He gives it. Date of birth, gives it. He locates the guy and says, hmm, boy, it, it looks like, uh, according to the record, you've not done a lot of bad in your life, but you haven't done a lot of good either. I'm on the bubble about letting you in. Listen, is there anything that you've done that's not written down here that they might sway me one way or the other. The guy said, well, I think so. I was driving through downtown, and I looked, and there was a gang of thugs with knives out, circling this little old lady, threatening her to take her purse. I slammed on the brakes, ran over to that circle, broke through, grabbed the leader by the shirt, and slapped him. Said, you better leave her alone, or you're going to deal with me. St. Peter said, For really, that is awesome. <laughs> that's, that's very awesome. Uh, hey, when, by the way, did that happen? About five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell that next Sunday. There is really popular theology. It's not right theology. And by the way, there's nothing theological, theologically sound about that joke. Uh, but there is popular theology coming from our Bible college seminaries and in pulpits and churches all over the country, around the world. Everybody goes to heaven. It, it's wrong. It's not right. But there's this message, hey, look. This whole idea of judgment and hell overblown, maybe it, it wasn't even originally in the Bible. Maybe somebody added it to scare you to death, to sort of manipulate you into being good. But God is love. He loves everybody. And don't worry, everybody goes to heaven. And that is not true. According to the word of God, according to Jesus himself, it is not true. We're going to talk today who does go to heaven and who doesn't? And it might surprise you. 
And before we get too far into this, I have to tell you, this is challenging theology. Just about the time I, I figure I've got all my theology rightly zipped up and ordered, Jesus comes along and, and, and really impacts me. And, 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 I, and I question. And, and so as we go through these scriptures today, I'm begging you to let the Holy Spirit, not Todd, you let the scriptures, you let Jesus, the apostles, speak to you. And uh, I hope we'll all leave with the truth, what, what is really the truth. And in this passage today, and we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, if you'd like to turn there, Jesus is going to carefully and clearly define who does and who doesn't go to heaven. Some of these scriptures will be on the screen. Uh, most of them will be in the service uh, guide you have on the Bridge app. But I'm going to give you a lot of others that, that aren't going to appear. And I'm going to start in the Sermon on the Mount. This is what's going on in Matthew chapter 7. And, um, and just listen to me read this from verse 15. Jesus speaking, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree um, bears bad fruit. A good tree can't bear good fruit. A bad can't bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, Jesus is alluding to both the false prophets. You recognize these wolves in sheep's clothing by the fruit they bear. But he's also saying you will recognize a true believer by good fruit born out of their lives. I want you to remember this. By their fruit, you will recognize them. And then picking up... Matthew 7, verse 21, and this is our theme text for today. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This is what we're looking at today. Here's the king's command. Listen carefully. Let him speak to you today. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, Jesus here is talking about judgment day when people cry out to him, Lord, Lord. Let's pick up verse 22. Many will say to me, many on that day, Lord, 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 wait, wait. Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons? In your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That's challenging, isn't it? Tough theology. What's Jesus mean? Many people claim to be followers of Jesus. And they're really wolves in sheep's clothing. Some of them are absolute false prophets who never were born again. But I have to believe that Jesus here is speaking about people legitimately, legitimately born again who misuse the power of the Holy Spirit in them for their own own good. Now this is important, and I know this is thin ice theologically challenging for some of you. People who actually born again, actually given spiritual gifts like every believer is, they discover them and they use them, but they misuse them for their own glory. It's very self-centered of them. 
And about them, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. Do you remember Jesus talking about the Pharisees, the religious leaders in his day? They loved to parade themselves to the temple to pay their temple alms, their offerings. They would hire servants to go in front of them blowing trumpets, kind of a parade, a processional. Look at them, there they go. Man, and look at those bags of gold. Jesus watched that, and he told his disciples, I tell you the truth, they will receive their reward, and this is all they get. The notice of man, of men, but there's no heavenly reward in what they're doing. Because you see, they're doing it with the wrong motives. I have to tell you, that temptation flows in my blood. It, it, it may be in you, isn't it? Sort of this natural instinct to let people know just how good you are and, and sort of broadcast a little bit about what you do for the kingdom. I was reminded of a story I heard years ago about an up-and-coming uh, evangelist, a young man who was much sought after. I heard this story from the worship leader at one of his crusades. This guy was dynamic, and night after night, throngs of people came forward to put their faith in Christ. And on the last night, that guy preached a dynamite sermon. This worship leader is, is leading the choir, the praise team, and the, the, the crusade is singing. And just a vast number of people come down. And in the middle of that Holy Spirit moment, that young evangelist turned and mouthed privately that only the worship leader could hear and see. And he said, man, I am doing a great job tonight. He has his reward. Lord, didn't I cast out miracles? Didn't I do miracles? Didn't I cast out demons? Didn't I, didn't I attend church faithfully? Didn't I volunteer for thus and so? Didn't I give faithfully? If it's the wrong motives, if it's only bearing bad fruit, we may be on the wrong side of the aisle on Judgment Day. Who is he or she that enters the kingdom of heaven? Who's the real deal? Those who do the will of my Father. The Apostle Paul seems to be making commentary on this teaching of Jesus in his letter to the church at Galatia, and he's going to talk about fruit. He's going to talk about identifying good fruit, bad fruit. Galatians 5, 19 through 23, if you want to write that reference down. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he turns to the good fruit, and he reminds the Galatians of what kind of fruit they are to produce, where it comes from, what it looks like. But the fruit born from the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. By their fruits, you will know them. We have been saved by God's grace. And through our faith accepting this gift, we were then washed clean of our sins. And then we were sanctified, that is, filled with His Holy Spirit. Right? Isn't that 
how it goes? Is that, was that the progression in your own life? But then given a command to bear good fruit, to bear much good fruit by doing the will of my Father in heaven. Here's another interesting passage. You'll find this in Matthew chapter 12. And in this little paragraph, Jesus comes off a little haughty, even, can I say, snotty? Uh, you, you see what I mean. Let me read this. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside. They want to talk with you. He replied, who's my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever, here it is, does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Don't be tempted to think of him callous toward his family. Don't think of him being snotty here. He's making a wonderful point. Who is my real family? just like my mom, my brothers, my sisters, who is indeed a child of God? The one who does the will of my Father. Not someone that just got a ticket punched, but the one who bears fruit, doing the will of my Father. You see, we are born into his family. One of my favorite verses, let me just give you this reference, 1 John chapter 3. See what a great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is in fact what we are. A place at the table, children adopted, born of the King. What a great gift has been given to us. And as children of God, we are to do with action, with intentionality, with passion, the will of the Father doing much good. Well, let me quickly give you four descriptions from the scripture from Jesus and the apostle about what the will of the Father is. Don't you want to know? I don't want to miss doing that. And um, th while this isn't a comprehensive list these, this is a list that sounds almost identical to Jesus' own language. Number one, here's the will of the Father, that you would be saved. Let's turn the attention to us for a minute. You are here because the Holy Spirit called out to you. God in his love called out to you. And most of us are here today because we responded to the to the Spirit's call, and we gave our heart and our lives to Jesus. It is God's will to save lost people. The great desire of God is not to send people to hell. That is a false notion. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to Christ. Do you remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son that Whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish. It's God's will to save us, to save you, and to raise you up on the last day. Listen to Jesus himself, John 6, 40. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Keep that in mind as we go on. Number two, it is God's will that you and I live a holy life. Friend, if you don't get anything else today, tune in right now. Write this down. I want you to leave today with this passage. And I want you to go home and take spiritual inventory of your life. Listen carefully. This is the Apostle Paul from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It is God's will. Underline it. Here's the will of God, that you should be sanctified, holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is 
holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who don't know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins. As we told you and warned you, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now, you may not agree with me here. This theology may not align with mine. But Paul seems to be addressing people who have the Holy Spirit, who reject this teaching about purity in regards to sexual immorality. It is God's will that you are sanctified, holy, especially in your sexuality. Number three, it's God's will that you do good deeds. It's not on the screen. Let me read this from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. The apostle encouraged the church, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We are to do good deeds, bear much good fruit in action, through our actions. That's why it's so important to us, this new program we're launching, Discipleship Pathways. We want you to join us on a clear path to discipleship, helping you, among other things, find your spiritual gift, gifts, and find your place of service in the body here or in the community. We are to live a life of good deeds. And, and look at this from 1 Peter 2.15. For it is God's will. It is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Do good. Listen, this is Jesus in John 15. Let me give you this reference. It's important. John 15, 8 and 9. This is to my Father's glory. Are you listening? This is what brings my Father glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. By their fruit you will know them. And finally, number four, that you would live lives of thanksgiving all the time. This is a tough passage. Let me read it from 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Again, the Apostle Paul. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is tough. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will. Let me quickly say this. I want you to hear me. Don't misread this. The apostle doesn't say, here's God's will for you to give thanks for all circumstances. That's not what he says. We are to give thanks in all circumstances, th through all circumstances. Friend, you know this. It's easy to give thanks. It's easy to lift your hands in praise on good days wonderful days of health and bounty and luxury, wonderful days when no one is sick, no one's in the hospital. It's, um, it's good and easy to give thanks on those days. It's hard, nearly impossible to give thanks when the sky has crashed on you, when the storm is raging all about, when the doctor looks in, you, in your face and tells you that you're dying or that your loved one is dying, it's nearly impossible to force ourselves in the middle of that 
dark and stormy night to give thanks in that situation. Paul said that's God's will. And as we mature together in Christ and as we encourage each other in the faith, I hope you will learn to give thanks in spite of what's going on. To find a way in the storm, in the sickness, in the loss, to thank God. As you can imagine, in years of ministry, I have journeyed with people through impossibly heartbreaking times. And I secretly, privately think to myself, how do I thank God in this situation? And you would be surprised how the Holy Spirit has found a way in me and in those broken families to find a way, even in the face of great loss, to thank God. God. A number of years ago, the elders of our church were called to a home, greeted by a, a, a young child. Her daddy's dying. We go into the bedroom. We knew him. He'd been a part of our church. He had an awful disease. He was in pain constantly. It hurt him to speak. And he was dying. And we gathered around his bed. And I must confess, at that deathbed, I, 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 I said a prayer, but how do you give thanks in this situation? And we all prayed. But then he said something that has bolstered my faith. He whispered to us, gentlemen, God has a plan for me. God has a plan. And in a couple of days, he was deceased. That saint had learned to trust God in every stormy turn. And even on his deathbed, gave praise to God. It's not easy. Don't, don't, don't leave here thinking, that I'm telling you to do something trite. It's, it's nearly impossible. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do God's will by giving thanks in every situation. Now, very quickly, let me summarize. Um, but what about life's specifics? Um, what about knowing God's will for my life? I mean, like, what do I do with my life? What do I do vocationally? Should I change vocations? Should I move from here? Should I go there? Uh, what, what's God's plan for my finances, for my family? What does God really want me to do with my life? And wouldn't you want to know that? I mean, if it were possible for you to know, quote, God's good and pleasing and perfect will. Wouldn't you want to know? The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, in the first two verses, helps us with this. And he tells the church at Rome, there is a way to know. Now before I read it, let me explain to you that Paul is about to use an image very familiar with both Jews and Christians and the heathen in his day. This idea of worshipers coming to an altar and fire on the altar and they're bringing a, a live animal, a uh, sacrifice from their flock, or they're bringing the first fruit of their crops, food or vegetable. They're, they're bringing something that a priest is going to take and lay it on that flaming altar and it's going to be consumed there. That's what image Paul is using. I want you to know that as you listen to him from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, pleasing to God. 
this is your true worship. This is proper worship. And don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your thinking. Then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do you see, God is faithful in this matter, that if we offer our bodies every day living sacrifices, what do you need from me today? Living holy lives, full of sacrifice, wanting more than anything to honor God with your life. And if you will work to change your thinking, don't think like the world anymore. Paul said, don't conform to that woke mess out there, but be transformed in the way you think. Then you will know God's perfect, pleasing, good will for your life. Now, you may not be, get a clear message. Hey, yeah, you need to... You need to take, pull up roots and go to, to some foreign country. He may reveal it that way to you. He has certainly revealed very specific moves in my own life. But what Paul's really saying here is, don't you want to be in his will every day? Confident to know that I'm where he wants me today, doing what he wants me to do today living a holy life like he desires in me today. The Hebrew writer said this about Jesus and his death on the cross, that Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice on that altar for our sins. That God gave his own son and placed him on that altar fiery altar of pain and agony. And he died there for us and for our sins. And today as we share together in the Lord's Supper, as we put to our lips this bread, this cup, let us give thanks that he died in such a way and that he set an example for us that we bear much good fruit by doing the Father's will, by offering ourselves as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you in your great mercy, not wanting anyone to perish. You sent your best gift to us, your son Jesus. Laid him first in a manger, and then laid him on an altar of sacrifice, your own son, for me, for us. And Jesus, that you were willing. When you could have called a thousand angels to rescue you, you went to the cross, became obedient to the cross, because you, know, you knew Todd needed a savior, we needed a savior. And Holy Spirit, in these next quiet, reflective moments of communion, help us to take measure against that good gift about our own fruit, what we are bearing in our life, what sacrifices we are making, and what you're calling us to. Amen.